Hey, Restoration Church family, so glad that you've joined us today. And wherever you are, whatever you have been going through the last day, the last week since we were together last, um, we're just so glad that you're here and just want to say welcome. Um, this is a space that we want to share together. Um, whether you're joining us on Sunday morning or some other time during the week or even weeks from now, we believe that uh, there's just something special uh, that happens when we gather together to worship, to pray, and to hear from God's Word. So before we uh, enter into this time of worship right now, we're going to just take a moment and we're going to reflect on a psalm. And this is Psalm 34. It's, it's a passage that the church uh, communities of faith have used as uh, meditation, prayer, worship, really a liturgy for their time of worship for generations. And so we're going to reflect on these words today. So I just encourage you, before we go any further, just settle in, take a breath, and uh, let's reflect on the words of the scriptures together. Psalm 34, verse 1 says this, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears, and those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from my troubles, for the angel of the Lord is a guard, and he surrounds and defends all of those who fear him. So taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Amen. Let's worship together.
for you, for you, for you. He claimed a rich and he called you his treasure. Whoa. He calls you his treasure. Whoa. Father God, our hearts were made to be in communion and connection with your heart. And when we sing that we love you, when we sing that we'll never stop, what we're really saying is, Lord, that we want to be swept up in your love, in your faithfulness. God, not on our strength, but on your strength. Not on our goodness, but on your goodness. Not in our love, but in your love, God. It's that posture of humble surrender that we choose to take because we tried everything else. And all the striving and the flailing and the failing, all of it, God, it left us wanting nothing more than to be held by you. So come hold us, Father. Come love us. Come change us. Come strengthen us. Come empower us. We pray all of it in your name. In the name of your Son, Jesus. In the name of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Grace. Today we will be reading two passages from Scripture today. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, the book of Job, chapter 40, verses 1 through 14. After Job finished speaking, God responded like this. Then the Lord said to Job, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critics, but do you have the answers? Then Job replied to the Lord, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I would cover my mouth with my hand I had to say too much already. I have nothing more to say. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Will you discredit my justice and condemn me just to prove you are right? Are you as strong as God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? All right, put on your glory and splendor, your honor and majesty. Give vent to your anger let it overflow against the proud. Humiliate the proud with a glance, walk on the wicked where they stand, bury them in the dust, imprison them in the world of the dead. Then even I would praise you for the, your own strength would save you. Our second reading is from the New Testament, from the Gospel of John, chapter five, verses one through 13. The disciple John writes this, Sometime later, Jesus went to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Have a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. 
while I am trying to get in, someone else go down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Are you a question asker or an answer giver? Are you a question asker or an answer giver? What was the very first thing that came to your mind? All right, all my people out there who just answered immediately because you were so sure that you were all questions or you're all answers, I want you to do this this week. So go to someone, your spouse, your kids, your in-law, you can like text a friend and ask them this question. Do you experience me as someone who asks questions or as someone who has answers? I am a recovering answer giver. So as a kid, I had like all the big questions. You know, where is God? Why are we here? You tell me that, that God loves me, but does God really like me? And I love to ask my parents questions. I remember this one time I was in the car with my mom. We're in her like big old boat of a car and it's summertime, it's hot outside. So the windows are rolled down. I'm sticking to those pleather seats. Now seatbelts remember back then they are optional and we're rolling down the road, the highway in Long Island and I can see the ocean outside the window. And I just ask her, mom, what happens if Long Island sinks? It's like uh, those questions your kids ask you that you have absolutely no good answer for. And without missing a beat though, she says, well, you drown, uh, but then you'll be with Jesus. So if, if you are a child who is here with us, I want to assure you of something, that islands, they do not sink instantaneously. But I was, I was the oldest of a bunch of girls and I was definitely the question asker in the group. And so I would always be asking them these big questions. Where did we come from? Where are we going? Where is God? But there came a time in my life where asking questions, it, it started to feel too dangerous. See, my family, we went to church. My parents, they were part of building a Christian school. My dad, he worked at the local hospital. My mom, she was the school secretary. I mean, from the outside, it looked like everything was perfect. But behind closed doors, my parents, they were, they were really struggling to make their marriage work. See, they had both entered into marriage with all of their own baggage and pain from their own childhoods. And, and marriage is hard. We know that. And so watching them struggle and the uncertainty of not knowing what was gonna happen in my family, it shaped me. And I started to have all of these questions that I didn't have answers to. And that gives you just this real sense of uncertainty. And so when things felt uncertain in this big universe that we live in, and they felt really uncertain in my own small universe, well, you know what I started to do. I became an answer giver. And a lot of the answers that I thought that I had to have, they really involved faith. Like I kind of created a checklist. You know, if I did all these things, if I said all these things, if I, if I kept everyone happy, if I had all of the answers, then maybe, just maybe, I could create some certainty out of this uncertainty. I could bring some order to this disorder. And why? Well, I think at the time when I look back, I thought if I knew all the answers to all of the things, then maybe I would have 
some sense of control, some sense of safety, some sense of certainty. And when the world is uncertain, we crave certainty. And we want to know, like, who's 100% right and who's 100% wrong? You know, who's in and who's out? And we create these frameworks, these ideas to answer the questions that we really don't have any answers to. And if you don't have the answer, well, fake it till you make it, right? I mean, questions, they don't feel safe. And asking questions, it might force you to do some things. It might force you into expanding your understanding of who God is, expanding your understanding of who you are. It might force you to expand your theology, take you on a journey that you never expected. It may force you to change. It might ask you to start saying things like, I don't know, or like my personal favorite, I am still learning. And that doesn't feel like control. And so why are we talking today about question asking and answer giving? Well, if you've been with us for the last month or so, we've been talking about who we believe that we are called to be as a church community. And we talked about this idea about how we want to be people, a church family that's made up of people who don't all look the same or think the same or act the same or come from the same backgrounds. We want to be a place where everyone has a part in what God is building. And last week, Ken talked to us, and I'm sure you remember it, because we talked about this idea that we want to be people who tell our stories. We want to show up in honest and real and true authentic ways because our stories, they don't just shape us. We believe that our story is going to shape the people around us. And so today, we're talking about being a community that has more questions than we do answers. About being the kind of people that are willing to have difficult conversations, to enter into the difficult things that the, the community and that the culture is wrestling with. We want to show up as being honest and authentic. We want to listen to each other. And we want to be a people who is willing to say things where it is safe to say in our space, I don't know, or I'm just learning. We want to be the kind of church that is more in awe of the mystery of who God is than we are absolutely certain that we have got God all figured out. Now, did you ever think uh, about Jesus as a question asker? So the Bible records Jesus asking 307 questions. He only really answered four of them, which I think is wild. Like God entered humanity physically and God asked questions. And we see it first words from Jesus right at the beginning. You remember he was at the temple. His parents were looking for him and he asked them like, why are you looking for me? I, I, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? To some of the very last words that Jesus says when he cries out in a question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in the scripture that Grace read to us earlier, we, she told us a story and in that story, Jesus asks a paralyzed man a question, and that question leads to a miracle. But there's a group of people in that story that we need to pay attention to because they were the ultimate answer givers of the day. Now, we're gonna be people who read scripture together every single time we gather to worship. So what I'd like for you to do is when the person is reading scripture, just take out your notes app or take out a piece of paper and write that down, and then come back to it later in the week and reread that scripture. Because what you're gonna see is that God is probably gonna show you something new or even remind you of where God spoke to you through God's word in our Sunday services. And what you'll notice is as you're reading today's scripture that it skips from verse five, three to verse five. And in the King James version of the Bible, verse four is still in there. Now, don't be concerned that some verses are left out. This is not uncommon in the Bible. You'll notice it as you read it through. Sometimes it's because the verse was disputed. Sometimes it's because it wasn't in the original manuscripts or in all of the original manuscripts. So someone who's doing the translation decided to leave it out. But verse four is actually really important because what it does is it tells us what the people of that day in the ancient world thought was happening at that pool. So listen to the King James Version. This is verse four. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. 
Now, maybe this was folklore. Maybe it was a rumor. Uh, maybe some guy who had a bad shoulder got into the pool one day and he felt better and then the story kind of grew from there. Maybe it was a miraculous pool. But the truth is, if you were there at that pool, you had no other options. Like you were desperate, you needed healing. And when we look at it in its ancient context, we'll remember that they didn't have like Advil or Icy Hot, they didn't have orthopedic surgeons. Like it's just you at the pool and you're desperate for someone to heal you. And this guy, he had been sitting there for 38 years. And then Jesus shows up and Jesus asks him a question. He says this, do you want to get well? And I love how Jesus always asks the obvious. <laughs> But the guy thinks Jesus is confused, so he's like, oh no, no, listen, I need to be the first one into the water to be healed, and I'm paralyzed, I can't walk down there, and there's no one to help me, so I'm stuck. And listen, what happens next? Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Now, take notice in this story that very little time is spent on the healing. It's just like one verse. Because what John is doing is he's telling us all the things that happened around the healing. And John put a surprise in there. And it's much more surprising to people in the ancient world than it would be to us. It says, remember, this healing took place on the Sabbath. Now, to us, it might feel inconsequential. Like, you think of the Sabbath as Sunday, a day where you hang out with your family, where you have a good meal, where you rest and relax. Maybe you don't ever think about the Sabbath. But for the people who were hearing this story, the Sabbath had become so much more. And these Jewish leaders that are named here, these are the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders of the time. They, were, they heard this story about the healing and they're upset. I actually thought that was so sad. Like, it wasn't like they were like, wow. <laughs> This guy got healed, like he couldn't walk and now he could walk again. They weren't celebrating, they weren't rejoicing with him. Instead, they say this thing, they say, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. And we see Jesus confronting religious leaders with this type of thinking all throughout the Gospels. Because what they had done is they had expanded and interpreted God's good law. And they had turned it into these strict, heavy rules for the people to carry. And a lot of times what those rules did was they stole from the people the good things that God was doing. I mean, these leaders, they had very specific rules of who was in and who was out, of what you could do and what you couldn't do. And a lot of times they were the ones to enforce them. And so the reason that the mention of the Sabbath here is so important is because so many of those rules had to do with the Sabbath. So there, here, one of the rules uh, was that on the Sabbath, you were not allowed to take more than like a couple of steps outside of your front door. Now, of course, people under the heavy, oppressive weight of impossible religious rules are clever. And also, <laughs> they will come up with any way around it. And so what people would do is they would take like their chair cushion or their couch cushion, uh, and they would carry it with them while they walked down the street. And so like, if someone stopped them on the street and was like, hey, it's the Sabbath, you're not supposed to be out here walking, they would be like, oh, what do you, what do you mean? I, I have my cushion with me, I'm, I'm at home. I mean, it makes you wonder, what is the difference between a couch cushion and a mat? See, these Pharisees, they had created a checklist of all the things that people should do. They knew exactly what was right they had all of these ideas. They were certain that they knew who was in and who was out and what people should do, and they made them follow. Why? For the same reasons that we do. Control, certainty, safety. And we might hear this story and we focus on the healing, and the healing is so important, but I wonder today if what God is doing is showing us our reflection in the other people in the story. See, the Pharisees, they were so certain of 
who God was, of how God operated in the world. They were certain of how people should act and behave, of what they should do. They had created a checklist. They wanted everyone to be checking the box. They felt like they had to have all of the answers and it stole something from them because they missed something. They missed Jesus. Like if they had just shown up with a humble posture, maybe a little bit more less self-righteous, then what they would have seen is that God was at work right in front of them. They missed it. They missed the healing. They missed the power of God. They were focused on a mat and they missed the miracle. And I so don't want this for us. See, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that Christians have started to become more answer givers than question askers. And I think the place that you can see this played out so clearly is Facebook. Like Facebook is one of these things, it's this novel human experience. Everybody's thoughts and ideas and certainties and answers all written in one place and you can scroll back and read through them. And take a look, scroll through. I mean, you'll see in the face of devastation, we say things like, oh, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Oh, they're in a better place. We give pat answers to these complex societal issues. We, we tell people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. That's our answer to racism and poverty. We have all the answers. We have the checklist. We're telling people what they should do. And I'm concerned that we've lost our, our curiosity that we've stopped leaning in and listening and asking questions. I'm concerned that we aren't hearing about other people's journey and their stories and their opinions and their thoughts. And I don't want that for us. Cause see, it, it hurts the question askers, but it hurts the question answerers too. I mean, the first thing it does is it alienates people inside of our community and outside of our community who are wrestling with really difficult questions. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're here today and you are starting to ask yourself questions like, is God even real? Maybe you lost someone and you're saying, well, if God is good and God controls all things, and, this, and I lost to this person and God didn't stop it, then, then what does that even mean? Where is that God? Maybe you're wondering like, is the Bible even God's word? I, I just don't know. And these are serious questions that should be allowed serious reflection. And when we give simple pat answers, we stop the conversation and what we're telling people is your journey, your doubts, your questions, your searching, it's not welcome here. And that will have devastating, devastating outcomes. But it's not just the question askers that are hurt. It's the question answers too. And, and maybe that's you. Maybe what God wants to do for you today is expand your understanding. Maybe what God wants you to do is to unlearn some things. And maybe God wants to show you the way that God operates in our world in a new light. And I know it can feel dangerous and scary, but remember God's bigger than those fears. Ultimately, we are all gonna have moments in our life that shake us. We are all going to have times where we have more questions than we have answers. You can find yourself maybe losing someone too young too soon or someone that you love and care about breaks your trust, or you see Christians or churches behaving in ways that you never expected. Maybe you, you're gonna stumble upon something in the context or in the Bible that is confusing to you. Or maybe the way that you've understood Genesis will be challenged. Or you might meet someone who is a follower of Jesus. They love Jesus. They have a vibrant faith. They're serving the poor and they also do not share your view on hell. And it sort of makes a little bit of sense to you. I'm concerned that too many Christians are operating in defense mode. You know, maybe 20 years ago, you prayed a prayer and you accepted Jesus and then you created a checklist, 10 or 12 doctrinal boxes 
and for the last 20 years you have been doing everything that you can to fend off any discussion, any discussion about those. See, that's no way to live. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't hold firm beliefs, but if God is God and all truth is God's truth, then as followers of Jesus, we should welcome conversation and dialogue and things that that ask us to think outside of the way that we normally think. We should be welcoming that as followers of Jesus. We should be engaging in conversation, engaging in these sort of debates. Because what might happen is at the end of the conversation, you may be reaffirmed in your belief. You may know that what you have believed and are certain of is true. But what might also happen is that God might show you some new mystery of who God is and of how God operates in the world and of who God loves. And that is a beautiful thing that is worth the risk of asking questions. See, church, what God wants from you more than certainty is God wants faith. And the truth is we don't have all the answers. We never were supposed to. This faith is a mysterious faith. I mean, what did we think when we started to follow a God who is more mysterious than anything we could ever imagine and still closer than we could ever know or expect? And for me, what I have learned, and it hasn't always been easy, is that I don't have to have all the answers. But it's okay. It's okay if I say I don't know. It's okay if I'm still learning because if my King Jesus was a question asker and if I follow in the footsteps of a millennia of Christians who have wrestled with these hard questions, then I want to be someone who follows in those footsteps in that legacy too. What I've discovered over the years, and it hasn't always been easy, is that I don't have to have all the answers. That it's okay for me to say, I don't know to say I'm still figuring it out, I'm still learning. I have more questions than I do answers. But if my King Jesus was a question asker, and if we together follow in the footsteps of a millennia of Christians who wrestled with hard things, then we can be those type of people too. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can have questions. We can ask questions together. We can ask questions of each other. And the truth is that God will meet us in those questions, meet us in the mystery, in our doubts, in the unknown. And there is no circumstance, no situation that will separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. There is no question that you can ask. There is no doubt that you can have that is gonna separate you from God. You can rest assured in that today. And that sets us free because it gives us the freedom to ask the questions, to explore together, to be people who are truly curious, recognizing that we are standing on a firm foundation, a solid rock of a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we wanna understand who God is, this mysterious God, the person that we look to is Jesus. If you want to see God in action, look to the person of Jesus. And so today what we're going to do as we move towards the end of our service is we're gonna remember Jesus together in communion. And I love the image of the communion table because in my mind, even though we're all separate in different places taking communion together, I imagine us and we're sort of seated at a long table. And Jesus, the king question asker, is at the head of the table and we all have a seat and we're seated seated together and we're taking communion together and we're asking questions and Jesus is asking questions too. And so that's what we will do today. In just a moment, uh, you're gonna get up, you can go into your kitchen, get some crackers, get some juice, make sure you bring back enough for everyone. And when you sit down, We're gonna take a moment together just to reflect. We're gonna remember together the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And we're gonna take this moment of reflection and we're gonna come before God with our questions. And maybe for you, there needs to be a moment today of confession. 
where you need to say to God, God, there are places that I have shown up with answers that have not represented you in the way that you would have wanted me to. And maybe you have so many questions today. God can handle it. Take this time, ask God, God, tell God, God, I'm struggling. I don't know if you're real. God can handle that. God, I, I don't, I look around at this global pandemic. I don't understand what's happening. Where are you? God can handle it. Whatever they are, this is your moment, just you and God, quietly, exactly where you are, to ask God those questions. And remember that God is the firm foundation that you stand on. And God loves to hear questions from God's children. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and say, take and eat, this is my body. Let's take and eat the bread together. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my body that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take and drink together. Father God, we come before you, Lord, first, just a people grateful for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We don't ever want a moment to go by that we are not filled with gratitude for the truth of the sacrifice and the love and the grace that you gave to us. And God, today we come together, all of us, to you, recognizing that there are places in our life where we have had answers to questions, sometimes about you, God, that maybe didn't represent you in the light of your truth. God, we so wanted things to be certain and safe and known, we wanted some sense of control, God, because the world that we live in, it feels scary. It feels out of control and we are faced with uncertainty day in and day out, God. And so we ask you to forgive us for that. God, help us to be a people who are curious. Give us a new renewed sense of curiosity in you, in the mysteries of who you are, in the people around us. God, help us to be people who are able in the moment to be aware of our own actions so much that we begin to posture ourselves as people who ask questions and not people who have all the answers. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, I am asking that in the weeks ahead that you will prompt us over and over again in moments where we have the answer, where we think that we are certain and right, God, prompt us to ask a question instead of have an answer. And we believe, God, that as we practice this, that you'll do a new work in us. God, thank you that you are not a God who leaves us in our doubt. You are not a God who leaves us in the unknown or even in our questions. That there is no circumstance, no situation that can ever separate us from you, Father. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
final breath Jesus commands my destiny And no power of hell No scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me Jesus, we, we love you. We love singing about your story, the life that you lived on this earth, God's fullness in you, a human, allowing you to understand what we're going through for us to be able to serve a God who has experienced everything we experience. And what a gift that is. Because you see us in, in every moment, every season. And you know what we're experiencing. There's nothing that we can walk through that you don't understand. And so we can come before you in worship, in prayer, in different services with our communities of people and praise you because you are present, you are with us, you are understanding, and that is so good, and we are so grateful. And we offer this worship to you, this time to you, because you're worthy, and it's all we can give to you, it's all we have to give. We thank you for being who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>